Hello, welcome to this virtual organic chemistry lab. I'm Derek France. In today's video, we're going to perform a recrystallization, which is one of the most common techniques that organic chemists use to purify solid compounds. So let's talk a little bit first about the theory, and then we'll get started with the experiment. As the name suggests, in recrystallization, we are going to form crystals. Uh, the reason it's called recrystallization is because most solids are already in a crystalline form. Um, we are going to destroy those crystals and then reform them. And during that process, hopefully, we will purify our compound. So it's a very common technique uh, used for the purification of both organic and inorganic compounds. And the principle behind uh, recrystallization is that molecules of the same structure tend to organize in a crystal lattice with themselves with the same molecules. And during that process, they exclude impurity molecules that don't match the crystal lattice. So let's talk about how the recrystallization experiment works. On this Erlenmeyer flask uh, illustration over here on the left, imagine that on the bottom here, you have just a powder of green material. This is just a, a powder. And that powder is almost certainly going to be in some microcrystalline form, but uh, they don't necessarily appear as crystals. They just appear as a fine powder. And then in that powder, we're going to have a couple, a little bit of red impurity. So that red material is going to be in a much lower proportion uh, in terms of moles compared to the green material, but it is in there as an impurity and we want to get rid of that red material. So the way the recrystallization works is you add solvent from the top. So we'll put a little line here to indicate a, that solvent is in there. And ideally at this point, this powder is not soluble. You do not want that to dissolve at room temperature or cooler uh, in the solvent that you uh, added. You want this to be suspended but not dissolved. And at this point, we're going to add heat to the system and take advantage of the principle that uh, most molecules, most compounds, will increase their solubility with increasing heat. And while this uh, solution is hot, our solute molecules are going to now be, uh, our compound is going to be dissolved and the solute molecules are going to be all randomly dispersed in the solution. So these green, uh, little green dots are indicating solute molecules. They are all dispersed in the solution. And uh, we also have our red impurity also dispersed in that solution. So it's dispersed, it's dissolved. This would look like a totally transparent solution. Um, everything is dissolved and there we go. In order to perform the recrystallization, we have to then cool the system. And we wanna cool it gradually. You don't wanna shock the system with a really quick, rapid cooling. You wanna let it cool gradually. And as this happens, the compounds will become less soluble in that solution. And these green molecules will start to organize. They'll start to find little um, ways to organize together into a crystal lattice. They'll start to kind of form these crystal lattices. At first, uh, we're going to still have a lot of these green dots around. They're still mostly going to be dissolved, but a little bit of a crystal nucleation site is going to form. As this keeps growing, eventually it's going to just grow and grow and grow and probably fall down to the bottom due to gravity. And during this process, as this crystalline structure grows, these impurity molecules are still going to be floating around. They're not going to enter into this crystal structure because of that principle that like uh, molecules will form crystal lattices together and exclude impurity molecules. So this keeps going. This is definitely drawn as a huge crystal in relation to the, the flask. It's <laughs> normally not going to be that size. But um, this is the idea we, we see uh, upon cooling 
and that cooling could just be room temperature or maybe you have to eventually cool it down in, in an ice bath to, to really uh, get the crystals to crash out of the solution. So to recap, let's talk about what makes a good crystallization solvent. The compound that you're interested in recrystallizing is insoluble at room temperature and below, and soluble when heated. And then finally, upon cooling, crystals form. A recrystallization that you may have performed even as a child was the formation of rock candy from sugar. Uh, if you look at sugar that you might have in your kitchen, in, unless it's the confectioner's powdered sugar, it's going to be a crystalline form. And uh, that sugar is made up of sucrose. And that has a pretty complex molecular structure that looks like this. All right, so that's uh, the sucrose, uh, the D-sucrose molecular structure. And let's take a look at how this molecule packs together in its crystal lattice. So this is the crystalline molecular structure of sucrose. Uh, up here at the top is the six-membered ring structure coming from the glucose part of the molecule. And down here is the five-membered ring part of the molecule coming from the fructose uh, molecule. And this is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose together. Now, uh, this is in a line uh, structure right now. We could also place this in a space-filling molecule, mo model, excuse me. So this is showing all of the the atomic radii of each uh, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen molecule. This is a, a, a better representation of the true structure of the molecule. Uh, we can also make a ball and stick molecule so that you can just see all of the individual atoms. For the simplicity of the next thing I want to show you, I'm going to leave it in uh, this line structure called a capped stick um, structure. And uh, let's take a look at how this molecule packs in a crystal. And so what we have here is a unit cell. So this brick, this sort of um, rhomboidal brick that, that appears around these two structures, that's what's called the, the unit cell. And so there are two molecules right here inside of this brick. And the way the crystal works is that this brick just repeats over and over and over and over again. So I'll zoom out here, and there you can see that brick. And uh, this, will this will just expand in across all uh, three Cartesian coordinates to form the, the, the full large crystalline structure that we see when we either visualize or create uh, a, mole a crystal of um, table sugar. And here we have a larger expansion of that crystalline structure across all three Cartesian coordinates. You can see it is quite complex, but as I rotate it around, you can see a, periodici a periodicity. You can see that the molecules uh, are arranged in a very specific structure. There we go. So we can see that the molecules are laid up on top of each other in a very specific structure. And it's the formation of this crystal lattice and the stability um, that comes with forming this crystal lattice that causes the molecules to exclude impurity molecules that would disturb that crystal lattice. All right, let's get to work. In a previous episode, we performed an extraction and we got a nice white solid, uh, which is the acidic material, and we placed it in this uh, filter paper wrap. Today, we're gonna purify that compound by recrystallization. But first, we have to figure out what solvent system will be appropriate to perform the recrystallization. I have placed 0.03 grams of our organic acid in each of these test tubes right here. And we will begin by testing um, water, isopropanol, heptane, and toluene as potential solvents for recrystallization. 
So the first thing we need to do is add solvent to these test tubes and make sure that the solid does not dissolve at room temperature. If it dissolves at room temperature, it's not going to be an effective solvent for recrystallization. The solvents have now been added. Let's uh, take a look at the solubilities at room temperature. So we'll look at water first when we shake our compound here in water. We see that it is completely insoluble. It does not dissolve. So water is a potential um, useful solvent for us. Um, it does not dissolve at room temperature. The isopropanol, as we shake, shake, shake. It looks like it also doesn't fully dissolve, but it looks like a little bit more has dissolved than in water, but it's, it's difficult to say. Um, so uh, isopropanol is also a potentially uh, useful solvent for us. Heptane. does not dissolve. Um, if we compare the isopropanol and heptane, and remember that the same amount of solid was in both of these, the isopropanol is on the left, the uh, heptane is on the right, it's clear that isopropanol is more solubilizing. There's definitely less visible solid material in the isopropanol here on the left than the heptane on the right. So I'm kind of getting a little bit nervous about isopropanol, and it seems that as I keep shaking it and shaking it and shaking it, it looks like more and more material is dissolving. So um, isopropanol is probably not going to be a great option. It could, it might work, but it looks like it's a little bit too solubilizing at room temperature. Where heptane uh, has not really dissolved much of our compound at all at room temperature. And then we'll move on to toluene here. So it looks like at least at this concentration, the compound does not dissolve in toluene. Let's just go back to the isopropanol here. It looks like now, after a bit of time, um, most of the material has now dissolved in isopropanol, which confirms that isopropanol will not be a useful solvent for us. So I'm going to just move the isopropanol uh, test tube to the back we will remove that as a candidate. Now we're going to place each of these test tubes in boiling water to heat them up and see if the solubility increases upon heating. So in this beaker is water that's heated to just a very gentle boil. And uh, we're going to add uh, each of these test tubes, not including the isopropanol, the water, heptane, and toluene tests. We're just going to add those tubes to this uh, warm water. So here's our water uh, sample. Place that in there. Uh, we can just leave the, 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 the tong on and uh, we have a uh, boiling stick to, to prevent any major large bubbles from forming and preventing them from shooting out of the back of the test tube. And we're aiming the test tube to the back anyway just in case that were to happen. We're going to let that sit and see if the compound dissolves at this temperature. All right, so if you look in that test tube right now, it has dissolved. There's a few little particles remaining. But we can see that uh, almost all of that material has dissolved. And when I pull it out, it's definitely much more soluble uh, than it was before. And it actually starts crystallizing immediately 
after taking out of the taking out of the warm water bath. So take a look, there it is. So I shake it up. So even at elevated temperature, it hasn't reached room temperature yet and it's cooling, it crashes out of solution. So here we have a potential crystallization candidate. However, it does uh, crystallize out of the solution while the solution is still pretty warm. So we will put this in the maybe category. Uh, as we let it sit at room temperature, we will see uh, presumably more material crash out. Now let's move on to our sample with uh, heptane. So that's what the compound looks like in heptane. You can see it's uh, there's a solid at the bottom and it is not dissolved. Let's put that in the warm water and see if it dissolves upon elevated temperature. The boiling point of heptane is below the boiling point of water. So we're gonna see some boiling here and uh, we're gonna be careful not to boil out all of that liquid inside the test tube. But if we do end up boiling some of the liquid out, we can always add a little bit more. So you can see it is boiling. So I'm gonna just carefully lift it out. Right, so what I'm observing here is that upon heating, we didn't really see any change in solubility. That solid material at the bottom there, it didn't seem to go into solution uh, at all upon heating. So for heptane, our material remains insoluble even upon heating. Now let's try toluene. This is our sample with toluene. Uh, the boiling point of toluene is higher than that of water. So we can let that sit. And we don't have to worry about the toluene boiling out as fast as the heptane. There are some particles up on top of the solvent line in the test tube, just trying to, to rinse those down. Okay, after some time at elevated temperature, it looks like that solution is uh, crystal clear and it is dissolved in there. There's a little bit left undissolved on the side of the, of the test tube, a little bit at the bottom. Sometimes it's difficult to tell. Hey, there, actually, we just saw a complete uh, crystallization. So the, the solution just got very cloudy. That went clearly from a nice clear solution to now a crystalline uh, suspension. So water and toluene both look like good potential uh, candidates for our recrystallization. All right, so here is our water uh, sample, which shows uh, a high degree of crystallization upon cooling. Here is our heptane, which also shows uh, uh, insolubility upon cooling, but that also did not look like it really dissolved at high temperature anyway and the toluene, which showed um, nice uh, precipitation here, insolubility at room temperature, but uh, did show solubility at elevated temperature. So we could choose whichever solvent we want. We could use, well, not whichever one we want, but we could pick water or toluene. Um, because water is safe, I'm going to choose water as the uh, better option. Toluene isn't a particularly uh, dangerous compound, but it is flammable and there are just risks associated with it. So if we have to choose between water and toluene, I'm going to pick water. All right, here is our material that we're going to use for our crystallization. It's a 1.82 grams of the acid, the organic acid that we recovered from our chemically active extraction. 
our TLC lab showed us that this material is already quite pure. So uh, we only had one uh, spot when we ran its TLC, quite pure. So I'm going to intentionally add an impurity. So, so this is 0 0.03 uh, grams, the brown stuff in there. Uh, it's 0 0.03 grams of naphthol. I'm going to swirl that around, make it a nice mixture. And I'm going to take a very small amount of this, about 10 to 15 milligrams, for TLC analysis. Then we'll be able to see how well our recrystallization purified this material. Now we are ready to perform our recrystallization. Here is our Erlenmeyer flask that has the material and I put just enough water or whatever recrystallization solvent you're going to use, you'll use that, but I used water because that's my recrystallization solvent. Just enough of that to cover the material. So we don't want to add too much and have it dissolve, but we don't want to have too little either. If we put our organic compound directly on the heat, we have a chance to just burn it and uh, ruin it and lose everything. So uh, it's suspended in the solvent for now. We're going to let that reach a warm temperature. And we have warm, hot water uh, in a gentle boil right next to the recrystallization Erlenmeyer flask. So we can add water as necessary. So I'm not seeing any uh, solubility yet, but we haven't yet increased the temperature inside this flask to boil. Okay, now at this point we have vaporization, uh, I should say condensation of the vapor at the bottom uh, forming right here. Uh, so we, we have reached just about the boiling point of water. I'm going to start adding water from this flask over to here. Now I want to pick this up and swirl it a little bit, but it's very hot. So I have a paper towel that I've folded up like this. And that will create a heat insulator. So I can pick this up, carefully swirl it. And it's very critical that all of that compound dissolves. We don't want any undissolved material in the recrystallization. It's a little bit too hot right now. It's boiling a little more vigorously than I would like, so I'm gonna turn the heat uh, down a little bit. And you can use your uh, boiling stick to s uh, stir the material, get it all dissolved. Right now, it looks like we have this foam on the top. So we have a foam on the top, but is that undissolved compound? I can't quite tell. I'm going to just heat it a little bit more and put some more water in there just to make sure um, that this is all dissolved. Now at this point, it does look to me that all of our compound over here is fully dissolved. We're seeing a bit of foaming at the top. I almost touched it with my bare hands. That would have been hot. So be careful, make sure you're always thoughtful. You don't do anything instinctively. Yeah, so uh, there's no undissolved solid in here anymore. Uh, that whiteness that we see is all just due to the foaming. At this point, it does look like our compound is fully dissolved. The solution is uh, not showing any solid particles anymore. Uh, we do see some white foaming, but that's uh, not an uncommon sight when you have solute 
dissolved in the material, dissolved in the solution, I should say. And I think we're ready to start the recrystallization, um, to start the crystallization part of the recrystallization. I've placed a cork ring upside down on top of the bench top. The bench top is as metal that's covered in some polymer and it's quite cold. It sucks the heat right away out of any material that you put on top. So this upside down cork ring is going to be a heat insulator. Uh, the goal of, of the recrystallization is to crystallize as slowly as you can. Uh, the more slowly that the recrystallization occurs, the larger uh, crystals you're going to get and the better uh, purification you're going to get. All right, putting the hot flask down on this cork ring, and we're gonna watch the recrystallization occur. There's an immediate formation of some crystals. Just wait to see what else happens. All right, this flask has been sitting for a little while. And as you could see in the time lapse, we have quite a bit of crystallization. You can see there. The formation of beautiful crystalline structures. We're going to now place this on the bench top. It's still quite warm, and uh, after it sits on the bench top for a little while, I'm going to put it in an ice bath just to get all of the crystals out of the solution. Our solid material has now been in ice uh, for about 10 minutes after being on the bench top for 10 minutes, and we can see here that there's quite a bit of crystallization, quite a lot of solid in there. So we're ready to collect that solid using vacuum filtration. Just to remind us, I just put the vacuum on, we clamp the flask, we have a Buchner funnel with a filter paper inside. Uh, make sure you clamp it, otherwise it can fall over during the course of the filtration. So we're going to carefully, before we begin, almost forgot this step, it's really important, put a little bit of uh, the solvent that you're going to use in the filtration. In this case, it's water. Uh, we have some cold water that we've been keeping on ice as well. Inspect. You can't see this, but I can see from the top that the paper is nice and uh, uh, suctioned down to the bottom and it's nice and flat. So we can begin filtering off our crystals. And look, there's a lot of crystals remaining. We want to make sure we get as many of those as we can. So we can rinse that out with cold water. So whatever solvent you're using, you wanna use, uh, you wanna uh, keep that solvent nice and cool to uh, limit the amount of re, um, re-dissolving that you will do during this process. You don't wanna re-dissolve uh, much material. If a little bit does re-dissolve, it's not the end of the world. If we look at our crystals up here, Turn the vacuum off. Take a look at that. Beautiful, beautiful crystals. Uh, nice needles. Just see, they doesn't look like it looked before. Before it, uh, they looked like crystals, crystals, but they weren't these big needles like we see here. Now we're going to examine how well this crystallization purified our compound. Remember, we put a little bit of an impurity in there. Um, let's see how well this crystallization purified this compound using thin layer chromatography. 
I've prepared a TLC plate here with a line one centimeter above and one center, uh, centimeter below the top of the, of the plate. Uh, in this vial right here on the left side is the original mixture pre-recrystallization. So that had our organic acid in it, and I added a small amount of naphthol, naphthol, as an impurity. Over here, we have a vial containing our beautiful new crystals, and each of these vials has a little bit of acetone added to dissolve the solid. So I'm going to put a spot on the left side, which is the crude original mix. Put a spot there. And I'm going to use the uh, UV lamp to make sure we can see a spot. And as you can see, there is a spot there. So we see it. That means that we have uh, enough, hopefully not too much. We'll find out after we run if we put too much. And then I'll put a spot of the material that is our beautiful new crystal on the right side. Again, let's confirm that we can see that spot. And yes, again, we can. So the left side contains the original mix. The right side contains our new um, recrystallized material. Just let it sit here just for a few moments and let that acetone evaporate because we don't want acetone in there. And I'm gonna use dichloromethane as our solvent system. Dichloromethane worked well as a solvent system in the TLC lab for this material. Uh, let's try dichloromethane and see if that is an effective uh, solvent system. Okay. TLC develop has developed, uh, the solvent line has gone all the way to the top pencil line. Let that sit. Let the dichloromethane evaporate. Okay, here is our TLC plate. We have let the dichloromethane evaporate. Let's examine how well uh, the TLC will show us the impurity. Oh, perfect. Okay, let me put the lamp right here. And remember, the left side is the recrystallization original mix. So at the bottom here is our um, unknown acid. And at the top here, there's a little spot. That spot is coming from the naphthol impurity. So on the left side, we see our compound that we wanted to recrystallize and an impurity. On the right side, the impurity signal up here is gone. So what does that indicate? It indicates that our recrystallization was successful. It's important to note here that naps 2 all is not water soluble. So it's not like it just washed away in the water because it was soluble. It is also insoluble. But because it was in there in a smaller amount, it was an impurity. We had much more of this material right here. Our crystals are predominantly the unknown acid material. And we were able to remove that impurity. Well, that concludes our video on recrystallization. I hope you were able to see how it's a really effective technique for the purification of organic compounds. We took a crude mixture. We added the impurity to make sure it was crude. And from that crude mixture, by heating, allowing it to dissolve in water, which in this case turned out to be a great solvent for us, and then letting it cool down and crystals to fall out, we were able to purify that compound. So we took a, an impure mix, and now we have this beautiful, pure, crystalline material. And we're going to use that material for our mixed melting point experiment. Well, that concludes this video. I look forward to seeing you next time. This has been Virtual Organic Chemistry Lab. I'm Derek France.